Welcome back to the uh, CP Media Podcast here. Welcome, Richard. Uh, how are you this evening? Yeah, good. Thanks, Angus. It's good to have the anchor man back after last week, trying to anchor the show myself and try and do, the, do a bit of talking at the same time. Uh, no, going well. Looking forward to the show tonight. And um, yeah, good to have my teammate back. Yeah, I apologise for, for being tardy last week and uh, not being able to front, but uh, certainly uh, got involved there one way, shape or another. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, that's good. Good to have you healthy and back on back on the uh, starting lineup again. Yeah, look, it's good, isn't it? Uh, especially with all that is still going on around us in the world, it's it's great to have uh, have good health and uh, you know be able to get outside still. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's so good. And and just uh, one of the best things about this podcast that we're doing here, I've um, talked to a few people recently, and um, Brett Layden in particular mentioned that this is kind of like country calendar. Uh, bringing out and, and cheering on all these awesome New Zealanders and awesome people, not just New Zealanders, doing their thing and um, and sharing their stories, getting in, in the back end and, and finding out more about them. Oh, it's an interesting reference, country calendar. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> that we are the country calendar of endurance sport. Is that what we're saying? I think that's what we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Now, true. Real stories. We didn't talk about this. I'm pretty sure we didn't, unless my mind's absolutely slipped. But we talk about, uh, you know, you just said that you've been talking to some people about the show and da da da. But have you not got a story uh, from Auckland to tell us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a few weeks back, my wife went for a bit of a girls' weekend. Had a was having a hair done, and in that, uh, while she was having a hair done, she was uh, talking to the hairdresser, and she mentioned that she's been listening to this podcast, and she was she's a, a PT and starting to get into a bit more endurance sport, and she said she's listening to this podcast. It comes out on a Wednesday night every week, and. Um, um, and uh, and then uh, the the others that were with Tash, my wife, sort of almost spat the coffee out at the same time, going, "Oh, well, actually, I think I know that guy." Uh, so <laughs> world famous, eh? How about that? That's pretty cool. Hey, that's awesome. That is awesome. Such good feedback. That is right. Well, we have a show to run. Uh, we're not here just to talk about uh, how famous we are, Rich, and uh, <laughs> our to next autograph. We actually got three brilliant guests lined up tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, from back to front, it's always good to start, uh, go that way in terms of introducing the show. We're going to uh, finish off with Kim Vargo. So she's our CP strength coach. You uh, will have seen her in a whole bunch of strength videos that we've done if you uh, do a bit of coaching with us. So we're going to talk to her specifically about her top tips of strength training and how to incorporate it into oh, I was a bit of... Bit of cooey freeze going on there, but there's no pressure for Kim um, this week. Uh, she's used to have been pre-recorded, and we're going to put her on front of the camera and go live. Um, I can see her in the background there already, already fretting. Rich, you need to sort yourself out there. But <clears throat> second guest that we're going to have on uh, is John Pebbles, and John uh, last year participated in the Tour Aotearoa, um, which is one, of, which is New Zealand's longest. Uh, bike packing adventure races that we do here in New Zealand, right from the top of Cape Rianga all the way down to Bluff. Uh, so can't wait to hear some stories uh, from John of his journeys. Uh, and also, we're going to start the show with um, Caden. And, oh, Rich, you're back. Oh, am I back? Can you hear me again? How about now? I can hear you. You're just in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's let's enjoy Caden. So Caden... Um, is a elite level marathon runner with a PB of 2.15 for the marathon. So just some stats on 2.15. Um, that's running three minute 12 Ks for an entire marathon. I don't think I can do one of those. Um, and that's actually 19.2 Ks an hour uh, if you're that's riding your bike or driving your car. So running along. So um, wore the back, and as a result of that PB, wore the black singlet in the World Champs in Doha uh, late last year as well. So we're, we're going to have a good chat about his training, his racing, and his journey to wear the Black Singlet represent New Zealand. And uh, Caden's also a really key component of our performance network. So that's a bunch of people that we refer to, we trust, that will look after our athletes from strength, from nutrition, from, from physio, from mental skills, etc. So he works with a number of our people and he's going to share some of his key tips as a physio to help develop running and, uh, and your running and your movement and then to stay injury-free at the same time. Mm. Uh, extremely fast. That is just... I'd, I'd love to... Uh, I guess, um, you know, to put that, like you so said, put it in perspective, but what we actually need one day is to turn a treadmill on at uh, three minute 15 pace and uh, drop some people on the treadmill and see how, how long they can run on it for. 19.2 k's an hour. Yeah, just hang in there. There's a, that, it's the whir of it going. Because not many treadmills <laughs> actually go that fast. That's another yeah. thing. <laughs> All right, without further ado, let's bring Caden in. Welcome, Caden. G'day, guys. How are we doing? Good, thank you. 
Good. Thanks, yeah. Gaden. How are you getting on tonight? Doing well, thank you. Yep. Yep. Just Good finished stuff. work, actually. So managed to get some dinner in and um, get ready for this. So that's good. Good job. Good job. How's the running? How's the, the balance of work and running and things like that going for you at the moment? Where are you at with obviously your season being um, COVIDed out a lot of it and uh, goals change? Yeah. So I think the week before um, lockdown, I was... Uh, no, sorry, the week after lockdown, I was supposed to be going to um, Germany to prepare for Rotterdam Marathon. Um, so after Doha, um, I realised that Olympic qualification was a possibility. Um, prior to that, I hadn't really crossed my mind. So, um, so yeah, so I was preparing for that, um, and obviously that didn't go ahead. So um, I actually took the opportunity during lockdown just to get on top of some things that had been bothering me for a while. I'd had a left hamstring tendinopathy since um, Gold Coast Marathon that I hadn't quite addressed. Um, and then my left, uh, no, sorry, yeah, left Achilles flared up as well. So um, I had a bit of work to do during lockdown to get my body back into a place where I could train hard again. So it was kind of nice to have a bit of an opportunity to do that. And uh, I did some stuff that I normally wouldn't do, like did quite a bit of plyometric training. Um, cool. And yeah, got myself in quite a good position. And I was actually, um, in between jobs um i had left my um previous role and um hadn't quite started my new role i was meant to start there when i got back from europe so i hadn't didn't do a lot of work during lockdown i did some telemedicine consults and stuff like that um yeah. and then now yeah work and running is going well i'm actually um doing another paper at university at the moment as well so um just um chipping away at getting my master's completed yeah, so, good. so body um, good shape. yeah and, uh, and, yeah, but, uh, and developing the work side of things as well. Yeah, it's tough balancing them all, but um, I do enjoy working and I do enjoy running and I enjoy studying. So, um, yeah, it's just about being organised, really. That's yeah. that's what it takes. It's just good planning and good organisation. Good stuff. So we're pretty fortunate to be able to grab you tonight and and, uh, and to be able to share your story. So could you kick off with just a bit of, a bit of background on yourself, your story. Uh, how long have you had the goal of running for New Zealand for? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think um, when I was a youngster, I always dreamed of being an All Black, I think, um, as most Kiwi kids did, and I played a lot of rugby. Um, but then I remember picking up this book um, in my grandfather's library at home, um, which was actually John Walker's book. And I remember reading that and I was just um, captivated by it. And I think I read it in, in a couple of days. It was, you know, I was pretty young at the time. Um, so um, that was when the, I sort of first um, got a passion. Well, I got an interest in running. And, um, and also sort of the dream of running for New Zealand was sparked just hearing about the exploits of, um, or reading about the exploits of John Walker and, Running was also something that um, came quite naturally to me, so going for a run was never very difficult, um, and I got quite good success at it from a young age. So, um, yeah, uh, from, from from about sort of ten years on, I I really loved running and and wanted to go as far as I could in the sport. And you've got uh, you you grew up in Dunedin um, and ran around the hills of Dunedin. And I have to say that's a, a spot that I sort of took up running and got out and about around Ross Creek and, and enjoyed that as well. So awesome place to, as a runner. But you had a really good, um, I guess, group and community and, and coaching in those early years as well. Yeah, I was very fortunate um, with the people that um, I met when I was younger. My first um, coach was a man called John Linyard, who uh, he lives in Nelson now, but he was my school teacher um, in Intermediate, and he saw my running talent um, when I first um started intermediate with him um, and he took me under his wing a bit and got me running um, and we used to go running after school um, and he sort of encouraged me to do club running um, and then when I went to high school um, I was fortunate enough to meet a man called Richard Barker who coached me right up until I was 20 and so he he uh, really set the foundation for me and taught me a lot about um, well, taught me a lot about life but um, taught me a lot about training and um, really pushed long-term development um, as an athlete and never never put results at secondary school um, ahead of long-term development. So um, he really educated me 
heavily on aerobic training and um, the benefits of a good planned um, training program. And we just had a lot of fun. Like we just spent hours running in the hills together and um, yeah, I, I couldn't have asked for a better, a better introduction to the sport and a better um, apprenticeship in the sport. And he, yeah, sent, he's, you know, a lot of what he's taught me, I still um, implement today for sure. And and a lot of those are those Lydia principles coming back to that, aren't they? In terms of that that aerobic engine and building that from the start and 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 the miles that you're running. Yeah, as most people who compete against me know my pure speed's not um, not super flash. So yep. um, you know the emphasis was always on aerobic development, and um, we always knew that the marathon was where I was going to end up. Um, so Richard was always you know quite quite. Um, good at sort of educating me on the benefits of the Lydiard program. Um, wouldn't say I follow a specific Lydiard program now, but I think the principles remain the same. So, mm -hmm. um, and um, my coach Chris Ballone has been influenced by Lydiard, but um, we 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 follow. We don't necessarily we don't stick to, to Lydiard schedules, but um, yeah. So you know, I was very fortunate. I had someone like that in my life. Yeah, I think I wouldn't have made it to Doha without without his help yeah 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 yeah. great so you were at university running lots you were um studying hard and then you um you ended up in an american university talk us through how that came about and that experience over in the states yeah so that was an interesting one um richard and i had discussed um going over to the states and we'd sort of decided that it probably wasn't the right thing for me to do um and to be honest, I never had any um, interest when I was at high school because the best I finished in high school, I got second in the, the road race at New Zealand Secondary Schools and my top placing in the cross country was 11th. So I wasn't um, I wasn't one of the top guys. Um, but then I had a pretty big year. Um, 2007, I started training pretty well once I got to university, for sort of starting to do double days for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, also um, trained quite a bit with a guy called Luke Herring who – um sort of took me under his wing a bit and we used to do some pretty good training together mm -hmm. so i improved quite a bit that year um and i ran 14.39 for 5k in december 2017 and awesome. i was the second fastest kiwi junior kiwi that year so um that sparked a little bit of interest and then peru contacted me um the following january or february and they actually flew out to Auckland, to, uh, the two coaches, and met me in Auckland. Um, wow. yeah. I was actually in, injured at the time. Um, and they offered me a full scholarship. And um, because of the academic um, standard of Peru, it was really a no-brainer. Like, I couldn't turn that down. Um, and Richard encouraged me to go. Um, so I accepted a full scholarship and, and then left the following August. Um and got over there so yeah and, there's a fairly oh what's that sorry oh, i was just gonna say how did, how did that go the, the pressure of racing um how did you deal with that and that's that's regular racing heaps of training how did the body cope how did you cope with that sort of things there's yeah it's an interesting um time and as i mentioned to you um my my viewpoint on that um <clears throat> on that time's changed i think over as i've matured and gotten older but um my first when i first got there I'd, i was a little bit naive um i'd never left new zealand before i was 20 and you know the furthest north i've been is auckland so um i hadn't hadn't lived outside of new zealand so or traveled outside of new zealand so it was a bit of a definitely a culture shock um and my expectations um were probably not very real about how i was gonna cope with that um well, the first I went over and I had a bit of a niggle, so I hadn't been running a lot. And my first race there was the pre-national cross country, um, which if anyone who under, who knows NCAA cross country, um, the pre-nationals is um, very very high quality meet. And I was in the open race. There was two races. There was the the blue race and the white race, and I was in the open race. And um, the open race was sort of for the guys that couldn't make the top five of their their team. Um, and I got fiftieth. And the guy that won the blue race, Sam Chalanga, went through the 5K split and an 8K cross country in 14.10. So um, it was just a massive 
massive shock for me. I was like, sort of like, oh, wow, okay, I've got a fair bit of work to do, which motivated me. And the following year, I actually um, qualified um, as an individual for the NCAA Cross Country Champs in 2009. And that was, um, that took a, a huge performance. I sort of look back at my career and think um, this should have been two real or two or three real key performances that race was I um, bet some very very good runners that day to finish 10th in the Great Lakes region which got me an auto spot for the NCAA champs and then Doha and oh Gold Coast and then Doha but um, yeah and then after that I sort of struggled a bit I got pretty homesick um, and uh, my performance just started to drop off a bit and I think that was because all the good work I'd done with Richard in New Zealand all the aerobic base had slowly started to wear away a little bit with the hard anaerobic training um that we were doing and then also um i just over time i didn't cope as well with the change in environment and you know the pressure was was high and at that time i didn't have the skill set to really deal with that level of pressure um how i would manage it now would be completely different but um you know it, it was a tough learning curve because um it, in some ways i didn't didn't do as well there as I could have because I didn't have the skills to navigate that pressure but um, it also made me realize that I needed to learn those skills um, yeah. and ultimately that's what led to me performing well in Gold Coast and then Doha so you know I was I ended up with some pretty severe injuries in my last year there I had um, two femoral stress fractures in my right right leg um, and came home pretty pretty um, sort of fed up with racing and um, and it took me took me about a year to get some form of motivation back to race. I was um, I still loved running and still got out running every day, but um, I couldn't quite take my body to to where I needed to to perform. So I went from being a 14, 25k runner in the US to then running 15, 36 at the New Zealand um, Championships in 2012 and coming second to last. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so was, you so you finished your you finished your study and things over there. Come back to New Zealand. Yeah, I graduated. Yeah, so I spent three years yeah. there and graduated with a, um, a bachelor of science um, in pre physical therapy. So it wasn't until I got my, well, it sort of co coincided with me doing physiotherapy. I, I sort of transferred some credits across from the University of Otago, which put me in the pre physical therapy course, which. Um, just was coincidence really so um towards the end of my time at Purdue after I suffered my first femoral stress fracture I was kind of like oh actually I'd quite like to be a physio so um I applied to the school of physiotherapy at Otago um yeah. once I graduated from Purdue and got accepted there so um yeah so I, I was proud of um my performances there and I was proud of my my um degree but I was certainly um you know, it was the steepest learning curve, one of the steepest learning curves you can have. And yeah, I'm so, um, also pleased that I was able to um, get myself out of that and perform well again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So timeframes, you've, you've finished here in 2011, is that right? Yeah, I graduated in 2011, um, yeah, and then came home um, in June of, or May of 2011, yeah. So you come back a bit broken, back like into university, physiotherapy school, build yourself back up again and 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 get back into racing so 2019 is kind of really your breakthrough uh marathon isn't it when you when you perform well so there's a fair gap there's a fair bit of work to be done and, and building back into there what what's kind of going on in those intermediate years yeah um there was an interesting time so coming back 2011 it took me about a year to to really want to race again um and my performance was really poor um comparative to what i had done in the states um Partly, you know, I was still struggling with what had happened to, to myself, you know, what, what I've been through in the US. I couldn't quite make sense of it. Um, I'd lost confidence in my body to train hard. So after having two femoral stress fractures, prior to that, I thought I was pretty bulletproof. You know, I thought, yeah. oh, yeah, I can handle 200k a week and I'm fine. And But that, um, that really blew that a little bit. So part of me that um, was, you know, had a bit of mongrel and um you know was was resilient got knocked um and i lost that side of my person well i didn't lose it but I, I couldn't access it for a while um yeah and and then going through physio school that's pretty busy 
um, it was a lot of work. And I was pretty determined. Like by then I was 23, 24, and I was still living at home with my parents. I was pretty determined to, you know, get a career and get a job and be able to support myself. And it was a bit um, tough trying to, you know, fund trips and stuff at that time. Um, mm. You know, I didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't couldn't travel a lot and to races and that sort of thing. So, um, and I just probably wasn't taking that good of care of myself as well. So overall, my performances were pretty poor. Like, um, you know, not not nothing like I was doing in the states. And then 2013, I managed to win the New Zealand um, 10,000 meter title, which was done on a really hot day in Tamaru. And the interesting thing about that was um, I'd actually been working as a labourer over the summer period for Lund Construction in Dunedin. I was painting a crane, so I was wearing about three layers of clothing and a respirator. So I think I was heat edited for the race. Yeah. <laughs> um, but once I um, graduated from physio school and um, met my wife and um, I was able to, once I was working, I was able to actually invest a bit more time into running again and I could afford to, um, you know, make sure I had good gear and um, and could travel to races and that sort of thing again. So, and then Pallone, my coach, gave me a pretty hard word in twenty the start of 2017 and he sort of said to me, look, Caden, if you, if you really want to, um, achieve your goals and you've going to have to really knuckle down and and put some effort in and um that was a pretty turning big turning point for me i sort of um I, you know when my first couple of years of work i was quite bad at working um big hours and i'm um, not prioritizing my my own training and that sort of thing so yep. i had to do that again um and be a bit better organized and um yeah, and so from 2017 onwards, things started to build again. I was training pretty regularly. I'm pretty strict with how much volume I do. Um, I always sort of make sure I'm I'm running close to 700 minutes of running a week. Um, and I've been like that. So how how hours and how um, how much distance are you running in that? Oh, it would be variable depending on the terrain. So we tend to yep. train based on um, – on minutes rather than distance. I don't use a GPS or anything like that. Um, yep. I just run run to time. But um, we say sort of 700 minutes is roughly 100 miles. Yep. I was 160K, yeah. yeah. So I was being pretty, I've only had two days off and since since 20, since May of 2017, I think. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to so. jump in here, Caden. Why minutes? Why, why do you run to minutes and not to, to distance? What's the theory behind that? Uh, the reason, uh, my theory, I've never actually spoken to Chris about it, but um, one, I've always done it because we never had GPS watches um, when I was growing up and they sort of came about and I never implemented them in training. But then two, um, minutes, uh, they're, they're independent of um, pace, obviously. So on a recovery run, you know, some days I'm running pretty slow. Um, so, you know, if I was trying to, you know, the purpose of a recovery runs to to aid in recovery. So if I was um, trying to hit a, a target distance all the time, I think that would influence my ability to recover. Mm -hmm. Or rather, if I just go for a 60-minute run, it's just a 60-minute run. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And then hills obviously slow you down. Um, so if you're doing a lot of hill work, your, your volume might not look pretty, but you're, um, in terms of Ks, but your effort is. Um, and then um, GPS is just pretty unreliable as much as... Some people like to th think it's pretty accurate. It's pretty poor. So um, you go running in Ross Creek in Dunedin and it's really under undercuts how much volume you've done because you're doing switchbacks yeah. all the time. So, yeah. 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 Um, it's just a – yeah. I just want to jump in um, in terms of some of the mental, uh, I guess, uh, things that you've been working on to really through that breakthrough performance that you had last year, um, so first of all on the Gold Coast, to actually – perform to your potential tell us a little bit about some of the things you're doing there and some of the challenges you're having and then how you actually dealt with that to actually run to your potential yeah so um a couple of performances highlighted it for me um gold coast half marathon in 26 uh 2018 i really underperformed i'd been going quite well in training and i'd had a bit of um stress outside of running um leading up to the race and i didn't cope so well with that and then just went into the race and really underperformed um 
so I sort of felt pretty disappointed after that race. And then again in um, the Zatapet Classic, the 10, 000, Australian 10,000 metre champs in December of 2018. Um, you know, I should have run a PB, but um, just disengaged a bit during the race um, after 5K and ended up running just over 30 minutes. I think I ran 30.01 or something like that. Um, and again, was really disappointed about that. And I couldn't quite understand what was happening. So um, I actually sought out um, the help of Kerry, Dr. Kerry Evans, who's um, a psychiatrist here in Christchurch who um, works closely with a number of sporting um, teams, in particular the All Blacks, um, just because I'd read a fair bit about his stuff and, and thought I needed to um, delve into what was holding me back a bit at times. Um, and the most... I think the the thing I learned um, from that it helped me um, understand what had happened in the US, but it also um, you know I developed a mindset uh, that wasn't um, conducive to great performances. Um, it was it was conducive to good performances, not but but not conducive to great performances. And I think part of me was afraid to take risks at times because of the outcome. Um, so I've become a lot less focused on outcome in races these days and, and more focused on my approach to a race um, and managing. You know, essentially, the brain um, will stop you before you're actually physically um, past your your capabilities. So, you know, how I view running these days is just about trying to find where my limits are. So if my if I can control my brain a little bit better when I'm racing, particularly the primitive part of my brain, um, then um, I can get a bit more out of myself. And I noticed things that were happening in races that I perceived as fatigue, um, or you know, a common common thing is lactate. Runners will talk about feeling lactate. I realised those things weren't actually um, necessarily physiological, um, more neurochemical. So. Um, at certain times in a race where I felt pressure or I was um, feeling under the pump, I'd start doing things that would um, slow me down. So I'd start looking at the other athletes around me and um, comparing myself to them or, um, you know, getting stuck into a bit of a negative loop where I'd be thinking that, you know, oh, I haven't done enough training or these guys are better than me in this way. And it's a really, um, once you get stuck into that space in a race, um, it's good night nurse really. So, um, one of the things I worked pretty hard on last year was um, having a trying to change the neural pathways and and have a different way of um, approaching races and approaching um, competition um, and within competition. So Gold Coast was a good example because the prior year I'd sort of gone into my shell a wee bit because I was running against some guys that had run at the Olympics and and I sort of didn't think I was good enough to be there and then. Um, 2019 at Gold Coast, I ran a good portion of the race with Benson Lawrence, who was the Australian 10K record holder at the time. I mean, he's run 27. I think he'd run 27.20 for 10K. And then um, I caught up to Yuki Kawayuchi, who won the Boston Marathon in 2018. And I think the the prior year, I would have not coped with that running in, you know, against company like that. But um, 2019, I really saw, to see, uh, really, um, saw it as an opportunity and um, – and really, you know, I think seeing those guys as people that were there to push me and help me rather than um, seeing them as a threat. So it's quite it's quite simple in a way, but um, it takes a lot of work because you have to be okay with acknowledging that you actually haven't been doing that well in some areas. And, um, and it's difficult because, you know, your brain's telling you the complete opposite of what you should be doing. So um, – it was more sort of walking towards pressure and being okay with, with pressure and also acknowledging that anxiety was going to be present in those situations. And I think a lot of the time we talk about anxiety as a, um, a thing that we should, you know, everyone says, I'll oh, be relaxed before a race, you know, be calm, but no one's calm before a race. <laughs> and, yep. and you have to accept that. And then you have to um, be comfortable with being really anxious before a race and, and still being able to com keep composed and controlled. But, um, see, see the pressure as, as an opportunity, not a threat. Yeah, no. And I really like that the fact that these people next to me are going to help me run my best rather than I'm competing against them and I wish they weren't here. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think if I look back at a lot of my best performances, they have been when I've been in really, really big competition. And, mm. um, and you know, it's the same in Doha, you know, I was 
could have easily have gone the other way, but instead I was like, oh, great. This kid from Dunedin is going to give these boys a bit of a run and we'll see what happens. And I think, yeah, it really that energizes you. Whereas if you're constantly worried about other athletes beating you, then that, that does the opposite. It doesn't energize you at all. So, you know, racing is all about getting the most out of yourself. So that's, that's really how I view it these days. It's just see, see how far I can go. And, you know, if there's someone that's physically better than me, then that's cool. But I don't want to be um, holding myself back because I'm afraid to put, put myself on the line. So, so what, Caden, what would you give uh, as your two top tips for uh, those that are out there watching, for those that want to run fast, that want to run far and, and still want to enjoy running it? What, what would you put your two sort of best, you know, go-to tips to? Um, I think, uh, I think you know, I think I preach often as a um, physio is, you know, it takes a lot of time to to be become a resilient runner if you're new to running. Um, so having patience, that's a massive virtue um, as an athlete. Trying not to um, climb the mountain overnight, but, you know, see it as a long-term plan and make sure you're prepared well. You know, I think um, having good people around you to advise you is really important and um, just setting realistic goals um, along the way and just making sure that you're, you respect your body um, and the time it needs to get used to running. Um, another one. Oh, you got me on that one. Um, yeah, I think patience is important. Um, and then, yeah, I think it, it is running not about comparing yourself to other people. It's about um, getting the most out of yourself. So I think that's the problem sometimes with Strava and those sorts of things is everybody's comparing and looking at what everyone else is doing. But at the end of the day, it's just about you and your journey. So um, keep focused on yourself and, and getting the most out of um, your body. And and then I think you'll, let, you'll be a lot happier with your running. Perfect. No, good, good. job, Kevin. They're, they're great things to share with others, and I think that uh, I just enjoy running for running's sake. And I really like the fact that you're you're running and just for minutes and time, and to make sure that run is a recovery run. And I can just jog today rather than thinking about getting that distance done. Really like the fact that you're focusing on your own performance, and that comes through in your racing as well. Um, so yeah, so some really good things to be able to share with others. Um, thanks heaps for heaps for sharing. I know that we could probably uh, continue to talk. You've got so much to share. Um, and uh, and obviously, as a physio, you're you're a great man to go and see and share that experience and, and help out. And and you've uh, done that with with me, getting uh, some strength training going on and helping me with my performance as well. So thanks for your time, um, thanks for sharing, and uh, all the best for the upcoming race season and and seeing how fast you can actually go. Cheers, guys. Thanks for your time. Thanks, thanks, Caden. Good job. Well done, Caden. Interesting there, Richard. You know, like you can run as fast as you want or you can, uh, I guess, uh, get yourself to that point that you can you can run as fast as you can or, or ride or whatever. But yep. uh, note that, you know, a lot of people always talk, come back to that high-end pressure. You know, once you really get into that that top level and, and all that pressure mounts on you, how important that mental state of mind actually is to you? Well, you just give yourself an opportunity, don't you, with your training. And there's so many things that, that that can affect you on actually doing your time or or competing against others on race day. So so it does come down to that mental side of things. How do I actually cope with that? And it is actually uh, walking forward to the challenges, Caden said, rather than uh, worrying about what else is happening and and just having a crack. You're better off going down in a blaze of glory and it not going well, having have, trying to see if you can stay with that person rather than just hanging back and oh oh I, I don't think I'll go there now. Correct. And, and do you know what else is a mental game? i tell you what else is a mental game. is getting on your bike uh, every morning for like 25 mornings in a row so that you can ride from one end of the New Zealand to the other. After you've already done bloody 150 Ks every day or whatever you've done. God, that's a mental, a mental, a mental challenge in its own, right? Yeah, I'd love to have a crack at that. But let's, uh, let's learn a little bit more about that, how, the type of people that do it and, and some experiences along the way. John, are you there? Come in. I am, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. I, interesting, actually, because I actually almost think it's the opposite. I think the mental challenge is sort of sitting there thinking, how am I going to do 3,000 Ks and get down to the bottom of the country? Whereas it's easier just to sort of wake up each day and turn up and say, right, well, let's head off and see where we get to. <laughs> Can't probably more of the approach that we took to. So, that's so we might, got us through. 
we might jump around here a bit, but let's just okay. start there. When, when you when you started the tour out here, row is what you rode. Um, yes. Three thousand odd k's from Cape Rianga to Bluff, basically all by bicycle. Um, did you have a game plan? Did you have a like I have to I have to ride uh, this amount of k's every day, no matter what? Or I I had spent a bit of time sort of looking at the the track, the course, and the distances, and sort of marking out sort of reasonable stops, and had set a you know plan of you know a few harder days, a few quieter days, but generally um, had a had a target to get to each day. But went into it with the thought being, you never know quite what's going to happen, puncture, breakdown, something major goes wrong. So we, I sort of wanted to be, to stick fairly close to that. So we had a bit of leeway that we sort of got through before we had to get back to work. But um, at the same time, not not being, um, you know, not being too stressed by it. Well, hopefully yeah, not. Yeah, because I mean, that, that's that's the first thing. So 25, 25 days it took you to is that we, we did it te- te- I'm, I'm, I'm saying 25 because we, we finished um, sort of about 10 in the morning and we'd started about one o'clock. So it was actually our 26th day that we actually, <laughs> we rolled over, but, um, but before the 24 hour period. <laughs> seven, seven. So that's, that's something like, uh, you know, for the average person, I know I, you know, two hour row is probably on my bucket list of things to do, but I think it's a two year project. Like I have to save a year's worth of holidays in the in the leading up year <laughs> to be able yeah. to apply a month take a month off work to actually go and do it absolutely i mean i'm sort of probably a bit luckier now you know our kids have grown up and off our hands and so sort of got that time where there's a little bit more free time to do it and i just sort of yeah just did have to find somebody to cover my uh my seat at work and things like that but fortunately managed to get that that was probably the hardest thing actually to make sure i had that cover and once i had that then uh, it was all good to go Mm. So let's let's uh, quickly talk. Let's talk some highlights. What were the highlights of uh, twenty five days of sitting on your backside? It, in some ways, I I, I struggle because I don't remember too many too many bad points. There were lots, just lots of different areas around which um, I did enjoy. I really quite enjoyed the, up in the North Island, probably just the far north. Hadn't really been around there. The the ride down from uh, you know, Cape Ranga down to sort of Poto Point. Um, quite quite enjoy going through Auckland because the bike tracks they have through there, the Northwestern Cycleway and then the, well, the southeastern one, which take you through, are, are so efficient. And you sort of right. go beside the motorway and you're cycling along and met quite a few people using those bike tracks who sort of would give you a good cheer, thumbs up and cheer on and that sort of thing. And, and, and that was quite cool. And did you just wonder a long way? Do people know what you're up to? Yeah, quite quite a few did seem to actually. Yeah, I think it's quite well known um, because of the way that it starts. We started towards the end of the first the first wave. They had about seven days, um, and then there was a, another wave which started about uh, five days or so after us. That's all to do with the tides on Cape Ranga, and so there'd been a few people through ahead of us, which right. um, also probably led the way. I know we run into we were on our way back from Karapodi, I think, uh, and we're at the ferry terminal and and ran into uh, half a dozen people that rode in there, and they were absolutely stoked that we knew what they were up to and uh, a friendly voice to chat to. But they were obviously yeah. had enough of chatting to themselves. So, how many people were in your gaggle? Were you alone, or did you have a group? Or no, I rode with a friend. I sort of I'd, uh, when I sort of first started thinking about doing it, I sort of put the idea out to a few people and didn't get much of a response. But then, um, yeah, a friend of mine, Steve Manning, was uh, was keen to do it as well. And so we then sort of, yeah, it would have been a good sort of year, 18 months back, we sort of decided, yeah, we'd try and work towards it. And uh, and then we sort of headed off from there. So, and we, we probably went into it thinking, never know what happens over the course of uh, a month and riding together and whether we may find we get, fractures with each other or we ride at different paces or things, but we ended up sticking together all the way to the end and, yeah, had a great time. Awesome, John. What's the, uh, this is a real gear orientated thing because you're obviously self-supported effectively, aren't you? So what's you your key gear tip in regards to doing this um, this event? So what was that? The, the... Well, your best gear tip, because like, it's all about gear, isn't it? Lightweight and you have to carry it all, you're self-supported. What's your go-to? What's your thing that you've learned and want to share? My 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 issue was the, the worst thing I did was 
I did take too much weight. I um I I probably I tend to prefer to or someone who prefers to make sure I've got everything just in case. And I have to sort of learn to just to be a bit more relaxed and to to back off. I think I had a couple of spare lights, for example, which I didn't need, and yeah, a few things like that which I could have dumped. And probably if I was doing it again, I reckon I could probably easily drop five kilos on what I carried. Right. That's a big yeah, difference. That's a it's quite a lot. Yeah, exactly. So, what do you do but, for? What did you do for? Uh, obviously, did you have one set of clothing for off the bike, and and how many? How many cycling, uh, I guess, associated clothing? How many sets of bibs did you have? Or basically, two sets of cycling clothing. You had two two shirts, two bibs, a um, couple of pe- and I think a couple of pairs of socks. Which we and we just tend to try and wa- wash stuff overnight. Most of it because it was debris, it would dry pretty well, so no great issues there. And then had a second set of uh, clothing for sort of wearing off the bike. You know, one of the hints which was told to me was sort of saying, get out of your sweaty bib shorts and um, as soon as you get off the bike and uh, just so you're not sort of hanging around those too long. Yep. And so tried to do that sort of thing, really. Yeah. Um, and what lots did you... Of, lots did of you chamois ride? cream. What did I ride? I had a hardtail, yeah. 29-inch hardtail. Yep. And that, again, I was, I, biggest decision for me was whether I was going to go with that or go with a uh, gravel bike. And uh, mm-hmm. everyone has a different opinion on that. There, there's a really good Facebook page um, for Tori Atura, and there's always a lot of discussion on that on what you should ride. It probably doesn't matter too much. Um, I was really pleased with my hardtail, and uh, it went really well. So, yeah, that was good. Nice, John. Uh, what about low lights? This is a tough event to do, and um, it's a long time, 25 days, riding your bike. There must be a few bits that you're like, oh, what am I doing here? The the, the first day for us was actually it, because we had a southerly along 90 Mile Beach. And oh. so... And because of the, where we started, we started on the Sunday because it, it was just, I thought that was going to be easier as far as getting up there because it's six hours or so from Auckland to get up to Cape Reang before you start. So we'd sort of headed up on the on the Saturday and then it was a one o'clock start and the southerly had come up. And yeah, so it was just, the first bit was quite nice. You go about 15 k's on the road and then you head about seven that k's along the Topaki Road towards Topaki Stream and and, and beside the sand dunes there watching the people on sandboards and that was cool and then you got on the beach and then it was whatever six or seven hours and we were doing about 10 to 12 k's heart rate was sitting at about 150 160 and it was it, that was a slog and by the time you know after about three or four hours of that it was uh, it was getting pretty tough and that was where we were wondering what to do and that and we rolled off the beach in the dark we had a beautiful sunset at about 8 30 at night um and then actually about that time the wind just dropped a wee bit and our speed suddenly picked up to about 18 k's and we rode that last bit under lights and we were dodging the the waves as they were coming in and out because above it was all soft sand you couldn't ride and no. uh, you know and, and a couple of hours before i didn't know if we were going to get off the beach or whether we'd be camping but we um rode under lights and got into our power about uh 9 30 at night and that was yeah that was really satisfying to sort of get through there but we were pretty stuffed. Yeah, that was day stuff. one. <laughs> How do you, so, one question I had um, from a, a couple of others that I mentioned that I was talking to you today was how do you train for it and how do you pace yourself and kind of know how far you're going to ride each day? How do you prepare yourself for that? It's hard to know. I, I underestimated how difficult it was. I sort of looked at um, the, the books and things. There's some great wee books which they, um, they put out with sort of the, the tips on what to do. And they have the... I don't know if you can see that the elevations on for various segments mm-hmm. and i sort of had a look at those and added up the elevations and got an idea but that underestimated all the little bits and ups and downs and probably um each day there was double the elevation what i what i'd initially judged or calculated so <laughs> there was quite a lot more work than i thought mm. um but we we I, most of my training was just normal sort of like the the cp rides on Wednesday nights, they're getting out on a Saturday and doing long rides and then had a few, not a large number, but a few rides sort of fully laden with all the gear. Um and yeah, I did quite a good one, nice one around um from Blenheim round to Havelock and through uh Whites Bay and up over into Picton around that one day, which uh Matt Sherwood had put me on to and we went over to Little Akalara on a few times, which was good because that was good clients up and down the Banks Peninsula is good for getting yep. that hill training, really. Great stuff out there on the Banks Peninsula. So fully laden, uh, how much 
like you said, you only did a few rides fully laden to get used to it. But yeah, obviously, there's quite a lot of difference in a bike handling when it's fully laden. Yeah, it was pretty pretty well balanced, but quite a lot of weight over the handlebars. I it sort of tried to. I had a frame bag which probably had about four or five kilos in it. There was a seat post bag out, hanging out the back, which was about four kilos, and then handlebar bag was about another four kilos. So it was spread pretty evenly around. I avoided a backpack. I sort of advised to do that, and I definitely mm -hmm. think over that long distance, not having, if you're stopping and starting, not pulling a backpack on your sweaty back is quite nice not to do. I probably carried too much water. I probably ha I had oh. safe for four drink bottles, and you know, and a lot. Of, I was a, particularly up north with when they had the drought. I was not quite sure what we were going to find, but even going, you know, you'd go through um, the far north, and there'd be chili bins out at the side of the road with water saying on the TA, help yourself sort of thing, which was oh. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of support. So, yeah, it, it was heavy, but, yeah, most of it, the weight you notice going up the hills, um, particularly, you know, some of the steep climbs going up Haas Pass, going up the last bit of um, mm. the Crown Range, and uh, particularly the um, Mongatapi Saddle coming out of uh, Havelock as you go across towards Nelson. Um, the last bit of that was definitely walking, and uh, it, it's heavy pushing a laden bike up there. So what sort of that's a good point. So you did you walked up there. How much a how much walking did you do? And what sort of shoe were you riding in? Um, I had a uh, I was wear, using what uh, what did they call it the XPD cleats, just mountain bike shoes. Yeah, yeah. But so, what, so uh, do you have like a, quite a soft shoe, soft sole, or a carbon sole? Or no, a... no, it was plastic sole, just a Shimano um, off the rack Shimano shoe. It basically is what I've been riding on the mountain bike for ages. I. Oh. It, the Mangatapi track destroyed those. The uh, the sole came away. <laughs> I noticed as by the time we got to the top, so it was a quick trip into a bike shop in Nelson to uh, replace those as they were as they got shot. Um, but yeah, my, my, we didn't actually. I didn't. I probably think we did less walking than I would have expected. The only real bit that um, we did was actually that last three k's up that saddle. I think pretty much everything else, even with the laden bike, managed to ride. Which was which was good. Nice. So let's let's jump to uh, the end. Let's jump to Bluff. And yeah. uh, when you arrived there after twenty five that twenty six slash twenty five days, mm -hmm. and you arrived there, tell me what that is like. Is it is it a feeling of triumph? Is it a feeling of what, is it an anti climax feeling or emotional it, or? It was almost a bit of an anti climax. It, it, it um, we had we'd sort of come from. The day before, we'd sort of come across from on uh, on the boat across from Queenstown through to Walter Peak, and then ridden the um, round the mountains trail from Walter Peak out. And the weather forecast was telling us there was a southerly about to hit. And having memories in our etched in our brains of that southerly coming down now Cape Reinga, we were sort of uh, <laughs> dreading what um, riding out to Bluff was going to be. So we sort of we got to Mosby and we were going to overnight, and the at, at that stage, the weather was still good, so we thought, fine, look, let's just push on. So we did another 70-odd case to get to Winton. And um, then the next morning, we still had the wind behind us. And so we met up, two of us, Steve, and there's another chap, uh, an engineer from New Plymouth, who we'd r ridden off and on with over the, the previous few days. And uh, the three of us basically just went as mini peloton out to Bluff, and we were doing 30 to 35 k's with this tailwind. And it was suddenly so easy, and it was quite an anti-climax as we rolled in about sort of 10 o'clock in the morning and thinking, hang on, um, we can't be here already. It, did, hmm. but yeah, it, it allowed you to do that after the start. It allowed us to do that, and yep. So we celebrated with a swim in Fovo Strait uh, just to finish off with. Just to, just, to, just to have a wee shower after 25 days. <laughs> Absolutely. Got to freshen up somehow. <laughs> what's your finish up, John? What's your one or two sort of key tips for others that are looking to do this? Oh, def definitely do it. If you, if you get the opportunity, you can get that time off to do it. It's definitely worth doing it. Um, the, I think the the Facebook page is really useful. Um, it makes makes a, there's lots of hints and tips on that. Um, get probably get your navigation sorted. That's quite useful. I. There's a few good things. I used a Garmin and I load the load the trails on that, which was good for your day to day. But um, every so often, it could you could get a bit confused with what it was telling you. And there's a chap who downloaded a um, 
a mapping app um, or the files onto a mapping app called Map Toaster. And that was actually really useful because you could use it even when you weren't near the, um, if you're out of cell phone range, um, as long as you preloaded it. And that was quite useful just to make sure you're heading the right direction. Yeah, good. Yeah. So, and, so 2022, yeah. write it down, Angus, two years. Yeah, to yeah, make yeah. Sure you do it. yeah. <laughs> 2022, uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's not let's not put anything out here live, Richard. You know what you yeah, know what happens when we talk about things on here. We're held to them. Yeah. Uh, John, <laughs> um, two last things. Uh, one, will you be, would you do it again? Uh, yeah, I would actually. I sort of came off it sort of so sort of humming and hawing. I think that possibly the other one I'd want to do is the the Corapero, which is the one going from the uh, Cape to Cape. So that's yep. going across from east to west Cape in the North Island. Yep. That's slightly shorter, but still looks an interesting one. And you cover different trails. The only we met people on the Timber, timber Trail, we crossed over with them as we're riding through that. But apart from yep. that, it's a different ride. But I actually, yeah, no, I'd quite like to do it. I'd like to do it and um, be a bit more sensible, cut the weight down, and uh, probably probably aim to camp a bit more. And uh, but yeah, I'd also probably try to do it in uh, a few less days. Mm. And, that would be the and so, I guess, I, I guess uh, the the last question is, is that how accessible is this challenge? Like twenty five days, three thousand kilometres, top to the bottom, sounds like a pretty big, uh, a pretty big bite of the apple there, all in one go. How accessible would you? Is it is it quite easy for someone to accomplish this? I think it is. I mean, you build you a lot of it. You can build your fitness as you go through, and if you've got a reasonable level of fitness when you start, and that's what we we're banking on, then actually you. You, you think your way through without being too bad. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's accessible for, for most people if they set their mind to it. You do want to sort of have a think about what you're carrying, what you're getting your training, and you have had that level of fitness beforehand. But, yeah, no, it's it's achievable, definitely. Oh, well, we look forward to the uh, Team CP Tour Out Your uh, training uh sessions that you're going to put on <laughs> now, now that you're the expert now that you're the expert at uh, Tour Out Your Row. Uh, if only, but <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, it was good. good. All right. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. Thank you. Sharing a little bit of your tour of our trip. Um, love to talk to you some more about that because you just never know, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Good job, John. Okay, thank Thanks you. Fantastic. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Good job. Oh, now okay. on Thursday. 2023. Eh? 2023. 2023, we're getting a year out. Write it down. It's on my bucket list as well. What a great thing to be able to do. Cycle touring is just the best way of travelling, is it? You got time to move the cows, and uh, and and just you just see things, uh, and you've got time, and it's uh, you can eat whatever the heck you like, and um, the journey and the fun is actually getting there rather than getting to the destination, then thinking about what am I going to do next. And, and it's it's really funny that I see the event as uh, the hardest thing about that event to me. Is getting a month off work like that's yeah, sort of the biggest yeah, yeah. challenge that i actually need to overcome to actually be able to do it yes yes yeah 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 absolutely uh one of those things isn't it it's, it's it's just one of those life things that you need to tick off uh to to make sure you make that time i know one of the best things i've ever done is uh, cycle tour it across the pyrenees and just amazing just to be able to do that over over a number of days and you really just get into a rhythm of it as well like it's um you set challenges you 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 change how long you're going for or how hard you're going. You have rest days, easy days, harder days, and, and it's yeah, just a fantastic experience. So, yep, it's definitely on my bucket list as well, Angus. And it can only be good for you. I've I've uh, witnessed again once more tonight on our CP Wednesday night Zwift sessions how strong John is now. And, uh, you know, it's certainly, it's certainly yeah. built some strength into him. But talking of building strength, uh, one lovely lady that we like to uh, – uh, share some time with Kim Vargo. Come on in. Hello. How's, how's the Kiwi internet there? <laughs> good. Just killing it out here, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's really good. all over it. All over it. Kim, we, I wanted to uh, get you on the show as you're a strength coach. Refer mm. people to you to help uh, to sort of try and put that piece together with um, with their athletes. Strength is super important. Um, it's often one of those things, especially if we're doing multiple discipline, is to actually how do I fit another discipline into my my training schedule and try and fit it with all the other things that I'm doing. Um, how important is strength training, and 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 is it something? Am I going to get bulk up? What, what's the? How does it affect you? Let's go back to the physiology and the and the um, science behind it. 
Yeah, sure. I think as an endurance athlete, it's just a non-negotiable. It is something that you have to do and you need to program it into your um, your, your schedule. And I think the reality is a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to you know lift some heavy weights. I'm going to bulk up. I'm going to massive. Um, and I'm just going to walk out looking like Arnold. Um, and, and that's just not true. But I think the, the kind of the precursor actually is if you are going to start a strength program, make sure you get someone who actually knows you know, what they're doing that can take you through because, you know, there's some risks in lifting and, um, but the benefits are just super, super, super outstanding. There's, there's so many, I could spend an hour probably just telling everybody how great strength, <laughs> strength training is. But yeah, I think there's a lot of myths out there um, that just need to be kind of put to bed really. Yeah. So tell us about a bit more about that physiology. What does strength training give us as an endurance athlete? Yeah, sure. Like the reality is, um, it is excellent, and it's making you a more consistent and faster athlete because you're actually looking after yourself. You're looking after your ligaments. You're looking after your tendons. Um, you're increasing your bone capacity. You're just increasing your body's ability to take on a heavier load for a longer period of time. So you can end up being, like I said before, more more consistent, faster over a longer period of time. Like multiple seasons, you can just keep performing and performing because you have that strength behind you. Yeah, 100%. And in terms of lifts, equipment, what should we be doing there? Like we've been doing a bunch of stuff together, uh, mm. the body weight stuff. Uh, what are a couple of key bits of gear that people should be having in their, in their home gym? Uh, yeah, I think one of my favorite things that I like to say is kind of embrace the bells. You know, the barbells, the dumbbells, the kettlebells. Um, you don't have to have a super exquisite gym. You know, Jake built me a squat rack out of some wood on that 24 hour challenge. And that's just been absolutely perfect. We have a barbell out there. We have a couple of kettlebells in the house and a few dumbbells and it's not super heavy stuff, but they are definitely something that I would recommend about a 12 and a 16 kilo, you know, kettlebell, some fives and eights, dumbbells, maybe some tens and just start with that. And if you're lucky to have a barbell, hundred percent, get that in there and get some training with that as well. Yeah, and what are a couple of key moves for a for a um, endurance athlete? What what should we be doing? What's a couple of like your go to must do for pretty much not everybody, but most people in regards to strength training? Yeah, sure. I'm a big fan of squats. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite new quotes I just read is that a barbell and a squat rack should be as essential in your house as a refrigerator. So yeah, big time, big time fan of some squats, deadlifting, getting that posterior chain. Um, and yeah, squats and deadlifts are probably my big for the lower body. And I'm a big fan as well of a bit of push press, just upper body, something getting engaged with that. But if I were to write you a program, I'd probably do three or four moves, maybe something a little bit explosive, maybe some type of a power clean. And that's it. Keep it simple, you know, like, um, four to three to six reps of like five sets of that kind of stuff, resting for two minutes twice a week. It's not a huge amount of work that you have to put in to get some excellent results so if i don't have anything if i don't have any bells mm -hmm. maybe i've got a dumbbell but um uh if i don't have any bells or i don't have a bar or whatever what, what's something we can do at home to uh do a bit of strength building with our own body weight or something around the house or something like that yeah sure we have a lot of fun at retro's house kind of finding some different tools like a chair a stool uh, you know, we've used his picnic table for some, you know, down under rows. There's a lot of stuff that you can do at home. And I think a lot of people underestimate body weight workouts. You know, if you can do some real solid full body press ups, that's you're pushing your body weight off the ground. That's pretty impressive. You know, you can do lots of squats, lunges, some plyometric jumping, skipping. I mean, we've just come up with a whole bunch of stuff for, um, uh, CP athletes just a couple of uh, this last week on just a whole bunch of different moves that wasn't even really anything more than body weight. So if you don't have the weights, that's cool. Your body will actually give you a nice bit of resistance training. And part Sorry. of that, uh, being part of our current athlete Facebook page, that's where people were currently working with. Uh, mm. That's one thing that we look to put out every week as a as a workout of the week. Some different stuff. And, yep. uh, and and most of it's just body weight type stuff. And part of the reason for that is to make sure I actually do it myself. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, um, it holds its purpose there. But, um, yeah, no, it's good. And then it just means that you fit it in and, and let's get at least a couple of those done a week. Three is mm. fantastic, but at least doing, twi doing it twice 
it makes a difference and I'm noticing a difference as well. And I think too the reality is is there's uh, you know periodization going on. So if you're in pre-season, you're going to be potentially lifting or doing some heavier work than you would during your season. During your season, you're back into your sports specific stuff. So you could be doing some lifting for some maintenance, but you're not going to be getting out there doing an 85% of your 1RM when you're in the middle of your season. You know, you just, your coach would be able to program that all for you, but you know, your strength training will look different throughout the seasons for what you're trying to achieve. And that's just not making sure you're not sore. So you can actually go running and you can ride your bike and go swimming and hiking bits and pieces as well. Yep. And what about co uh, core strength as uh, as part of that as well? Like how vital is that as, as far as running goes? You mentioned your um, squats and deadlifts and also yep. your pushing and pulling movements. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, massive. Um, core, is, core is key. Like I like to think about core to extremity. So any movement that you are going to do, you need to start by engaging the muscles of the core, right? So kind of like your glutes, your abs, kind of your hip area, just that whole kind of, muscular girdle if you can think about it something around your midsection that's keeping nice and tight so you activate that first and then you can think about moving your arms your legs all that kind of stuff it helps with balance it helps with your posture if you're a runner keeping your shoulders back being able to i mean it's just it's essential for actually moving well perfect good job um and one or two key tips to finish up kim in terms of uh in, in regards to anything else to add that we've missed out yeah, I, I think mobility plays a, a massive role of strength training sure. as well. Yep. You know, like you've got to be able to get that full range of motion from your joint. And, you know, endurance athletes, as I'm starting to learn while I'm doing my own training, you kind of stay in your same motion. Like you run straight, you cycle straight, you stay in the same plane. And I think you just become a lot stiffer because you're not moving outside of those kind of realms. And so mobility, stretching, full range of motion is pivotal. And there's lots of ways you can access kind of programs, YouTube, you know, some foam rolling, some ball. There's lots of stuff out there, but mobility needs to be in your plan just as much as strength training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you can move well and and moving sideways rather than just in one direction yeah. all the time. Uh, and that's where playing football with the kids out the back sort of thing, all those sorts of things make a difference as well. So you can do that. You're not going to injure yourself when you're doing these other movements as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that is a big part is just get out and play, move in different planes instead of going straight sideways, you know, like just move, play, have fun. Yeah. Good job. Brilliant. Well, Kim, cool. thank you for joining us. Um, yeah. Look forward to some more at home with Kim uh, <laughs> videos on the CP community and our CP athletes pages uh, and look forward to maybe partaking in a few of those uh, uh, <clears throat> challenges there that, that maybe I – you know, always watch, always watch, you know, but uh, maybe, maybe maybe I'm not getting strong by just watching TV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks, guys. Well done. Thanks Cheers, Kevin. All right, see you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Good job. Right, so we've got strength training lined up. We've got a um, – we've got uh, your goal set out for the next three years, haven't we? And I'm uh, going to need a bigger diary. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually – Speaking of diaries and speaking of uh, things that should be in the diary, we've got actually got a few things coming up just over the next uh, week to week or two or three. Uh, um, a new assuming, assuming that we all play ball and we all play nicely and COVID lets us do those things. But the first thing next week, not this weekend, but the, the next weekend, Saturday the 29th, yep. uh, just want to have a quick, uh, a quick reminder about that. Um, the Forest Run Fest at Bottle Lake Forest, put on by Fusion Events, um, there is a run there for everyone. There's, uh, it's a night run starting at uh, 6 o'clock for the half marathon runners. Uh, there's a half marathon, a 10K, a 5K, a 2K, and a kids race. So if you're looking for something to do on a Saturday night that doesn't include going to the pub, check out forestrunfest.co.nz, and hopefully we'll see you there with a head torch. Yeah, they do a great job of events, uh, the Fusion Events team. Yep. But, and once you've done that, uh, and you've burned a few calories and you've had a wee sleep and things, it's actually time for our spring brunch ride. Yeah, how good. I was trying to bring it. There it is. Look, there it is. The annual spring bunch run, ride, or walk. Yeah, we've been doing that for as long as Team CP is, um, has been rolling. And, and some of the early pitches are pretty funny. I'm not as grey as what I am now. That's for sure. The kids are still as little. So uh, it's such a good, great time to get together. Uh, it's totally free. Come for a ride. Meet us out at the Raspberry Cafe out at Tai Tap. Um, 
go for a ride, go for a run. Feel free to bring the kids along if you're running and they can bike beside you um, with their high vis, vis vest from school and just join us and make sure you have a, a big piece of cake and coffee to make sure we replenish all those calories that we may have just burnt. Yep, 100%. Uh, fun for everybody there. Uh, and uh, 19th of September, actually, no, wait, let's back the truck up here just to keep the calendar rolling. A bit of a shameless plug here. This one here, the South Island Crossfest, uh, which is going to be held at the Christchurch Agricultural Park, uh, 12th and 13th of September, uh, a two-day extravaganza um, and something for everybody if you're a, a bike lover. On Saturday, we are going to run for the roadies uh, a crit race, um, A, B and C grade crit races around the ag park there. Saturday night, it's party time and we're going to have some short track uh, grass racing with a, a DJ pumping some sounds, maybe a <laughs> beverage or two to be had there. Uh, and then the big day on Sunday where Cyclocross will have its uh, final shindig for 2020. Good job, good job, long time. Following that, if you can get yourself through that, and I'm a bit concerned about this one myself because I've got a bit of a job to do there, uh, but uh, the 19th of September, it's the race time again, a real strange time, Richard, to be having this. It is, it is, it is. So haul your body up the dyes pass up to the top and, uh, and then back up again to Hilltop and and just continue on to Akaroa. What a great day out and a great time to ride your bike. So looking forward to being part of that, part of our bunch police to help support the race and, and keep it safe. We'll be out there doing that. And, uh, yeah, just a great excuse to ride your bike and have a day out. That's it. So that's the calendar for now. We'll keep you updated with that as we get closer to those events. Uh, as always, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, we will be back next Wednesday, same bat time, same bat channel, same great chat, Richard. Perfect, and yeah, thank you to Caden, thank you to John, thank you to Kim for, for sharing their stories and sharing the expertise, and uh, all the best until next week. That's it. Until then, uh, spread the awesomeness. Get out there and do it. Well done. Over now. Push the wrong button.